Shall we get started? Yeah, it looks like it's about uh, 11 o'clock our time Pacific. So I think we're ready to start. Well, welcome to the practitioner track. I'm Elaine Deschamps and I serve on the IIF board of directors and I've been with the organization for uh, 22 years now. I'm really excited to uh, introduce Rand Ding who is gonna present on YouTube infrastructure capacity forecasting. And Rand is a software engineer in YouTube and she leads the YouTube resource management and capacity planning team. So let's uh, welcome Rand and uh, delighted to hear your presentation. Thanks everyone for coming to this session. I am really honored to give a presentation here. Uh, I will be talking about the YouTube infrastructure capacity forecasting and feel free to interrupt me during a presentation in case there is something that needs more clarification on the context. So uh, being the largest video hosting platform, YouTube is an integral part of millions of people's lives. We have two plus billions of users on the platform. And especially since the pandemic, we have seen that the engagement has picked up even stronger for the things that used to be people doing in person or physically that they move to online and especially through our platform. For example, on the right side here, you are seeing that there is uptick on the home workout session from all the countries across the globe. And we see the similar trends for uh, cooking sessions at home and uh, mental and physical well-being therapies, and just in general, anything that connects people. Remember, when you take videos on your phone, what are some challenges? Your battery might be running low, your storage might be running out, the phone is getting hotter and it can take a long time to send to friends. So if you think about how YouTube is handled everybody's videos, we have similar but scaled challenges. We, want, we need to make sure the reliability of a platform is able to handle the video processing. We need to ensure the storage capacity to store all these videos and the processing power because any any kind of bitstream processing requires all the CPU and RAM. And finally, we need network connectivity to be able to upload as well as distribute all these videos to our users around the globe. Otherwise, some of us might have seen this familiar picture of this purple sad monkey engineer saying, oh, oh, something went wrong on our platform. YouTube is powered by data centers machine capacity. These are physical large buildings of machines full of racks of servers and um, processing units in different continents of the globe. And here is example of Google data center in Belgium. But machine capacity can fail. What here is an uh, interesting uh, story that we found last year when our network engineers realized there is some mysterious network outages around a location and after investigation, as tweeted by our senior vice president, Urs here, what happened is there is a fallen cable on the ground and there were cows just randomly stepping on them, causing all these outages. So while this is an amusing story, it reveals that net, uh, capacity can fail and there were multiple reasons for that. Either it's caused by cows or natural disaster or human intervention. So that reveals the challenges of YouTube infrastructure. It's around this cycle of full item decision making. On the upper left corner, we see that as a company, we need to make sure that there is reliability around our capacity so that we can serve all our existing users. But that's not enough. We also have to accommodate the increase in demand, especially given the circumstance like the COVID and the things that the demand increase along with it. These two lead to this orange block of we need to build more so that we can continue to grow with the need. However, if we blindly build more, we will face high infrastructure cost and extra carbon footprint. So we said we tune back down again to build less to a point that we don't want to face the risk of uh, this reliability issue or we cannot have enough to accommodate the future growth. How do we handle this complex circle of decision-making, 
we use forecasting in our capacity planning. So today, I will be talking about how we use forecasting in YouTube capacity planning in general, and be sharing some customization that I found interesting that's very unique to our platform, and finally briefly talk about the COVID-19 impact. So at a high level, YouTube capacity planning is all about supply and demand. And before we go to the terminology and the logics around this, I'm gonna give a toy example. So we have a concrete understanding of what does capacity means in YouTube. Let's say being a normal YouTube user, I opened the YouTube site and typed in a search box cat video, meaning that I want to see some videos about cats. So this single string is actually gonna trigger a sequence of processing in our service backend. There will be one service that's going to pass the string of cat video and try to pull up the index of videos that out of the billions of videos, find the ones that related to cats. And then there'll be another server hold, holding on to this piece of finding that these videos are related to my search result and pull up the actual physical storage location for these cat videos. Then another set of servers will actually go and grab these videos from these storage locations and actually pass it back to my player so I can decide which ones I want to watch on it. So in this toy example, we see that a single user's single text string is causing a bunch of sequence processing in our platform and each every one of them will require some units of processing power, such as computing power, RAM, and storage, as well as network bandwidth. So that's what we mean by demand in capacity. It's we aggregate this single toy example of search for a video by billions of users, by all the different user journeys on YouTube. We can see that what's driving the organic demand that's calling for all this processing and capacity power. So with this understanding of this demand, we not only capture what's needed now, we also forecast what's needed in future. And with this data, we try to pull up the supply that we have and supply that we're about to build. Using the simple arithmetic between the two, we identify how much order is deficit and we plan for it, then we deploy it to the locations that we need them. So now we're gonna go a little bit deeper in how mathematically and model-based we are representing this kind of demand and planning for the demand. Going back to the toy example of searching for a cat video, let's say, remember the first one is there was gonna be a server that's gonna take this string of cat video and try to find all the videos related to cats. Let's say the blue droid on the top chart is the server that does that. So the blue, dro blue droid service will come up in terms of capacity planning two signals that's relevant. One is the green line says service resource usage. That's the actual physical computing and RAM resources that's needed to process this string of cat video searching. And, and you can see that there's a blue line much larger than the green line. It's called resource allocation. So why is allocation much bigger than the usage? It's almost doubled from this scale. It's because um, running a service is not just always in time to use exactly how much is needed. We need to provision for the worst case. So what we usually do is we look at the historical usage of this green line for let's say seven days. So we can identify the weekly peak that how much the service, when everybody's searching how much need it will be and then we plan for that. Then we pad that need additionally by some of these uh, extra padding redundancy. Let's say there is a cow stepping on cable somewhere, but we can still serve the rest of users. So we will be adding the capacity from one place by multiple locations, and that's the extra padding we're doing here. So as capacity planners, we're really trying to come up with that blue line of allocation that's driven by the green line of usage so that we know that we're not giving too much, but we're giving right amount that when the green line of usage going to fluctuate day by day and hour by hour, there is stable enough insurance to make sure 
any of these unexpected spike can still be accommodated. And similarly, there is this yellow droid, which probably is the service that's actually going to pull the video from the physical storage after the index result is passed. And the green droid is doing something else. And there are hundreds of thousands of services in YouTube that each does a very unique piece of handling of user journey. Now, my team as a capacity planner, so unfortunately, even though I am in the same company, there is no way to track what's always happening by these hundreds of thousands, thousands of services. But yet we have to plan for them. We have to give them the right amount, the enough amount at any given time. Um, that means if you look at the right side of this slide, me being the green droid, is we need to look at a pool of services, two lines, one is resource usage, and the top one is resource allocation and try to give the right amount of results allocation so all these services can have sufficient results for any time of their need. So how do we do that? Um, the, we to do that through forecasting as well as extracting the need by representing them in a meaningful data pieces. In this slide and the next one, I'm gonna go through this chart of example YouTube results forecasting. It has a lot of information, but we're gonna go through it in two steps. So on this one, we're gonna focus on the left rectangle of the actuals. If you remember from the previous slide, there were two lines of actuals. The green line is the actual usage of a service or a group of services. And the blue line is the allocation for all of them. And the question now is while we need to come up with a final allocation to give to all of them, which of these two signals is a better forecasting signal that we should use to derive this number? So what we observed is there were pros and cons on each of them. So allocation, even though it's the ultimate signal we need to come up with a number to render to these services, it has this inorganic pattern because as we know that usage is probably driven by organic users searching for things or watching things, the, the blue line is coming with all this weekly peak and extra pattern for redundancy. And sometimes developers or the service owner will actually manually tune it up or down based on their own understanding. So it's a lot more noisy and it also, uh, it's a lot bigger, as you can see here, sometimes it could be wasteful if the developer don't have a good understanding of how much they actually need, but they ask for a lot extra. Well, but on the other hand, if we purely rely on the organic green signal of the usage, we have the risk of under provisioning because if we only giving the numbers driven by the green one, we lose all this insurance around this weekly peak or any uh, reliability insurance if something goes wrong. So we need to find the balance between these two, given that we have these two sets of signals. So on this slide, we're going to talk about, now we have a good understanding of which of these signals of actual and allocation and usage have their own pros and cons and how do we actually do the forecasting. So we, do the, so we look at the right block of this example diagram, these are the forecasting candidates. We generate candidates through the standard forecasting technology, such as data cleaning, using denoising, interpolation, and seasonality handling. And the lucky part is we don't have to reinvent wheels. There were enough library, both in the industry as well as in our company that can do a bunch of this time series processing and generating the forecasting for us. Then we using these cleaned up input data, we generate multiple forecast candidates by varying these input signals. For example, through using either allocation, the blue line, or the usage, the green line. Sometimes we vary the horizon. Are we using six months history, one year, two years, and sometimes with some scaling additional to the generated forecast values. In this example, on the right block, we are showing three candidates. Well, the top light blue line is the 
apparently are linear momentum-based forecasting based on the dark blue line of allocation actuals. And the red line, which have a bit more sophisticated forecasting in it, that's a bit of seasonality, also data cleaning, so it's not over forecasting the trend. And finally, the, the lowest line, which is a set green forecasting line, it's a direct forecast of the green usage line. And it, it shows that the disadvantage of the usage-based forecasting that it's too small. If we want to use this value, then we either have to scale it up by five times and still even the slope doesn't seem to be reflecting the actual allocation trend. So among these three or even more candidates, our system then automatically picks the best performing one. We do that through a rolling window-based backtesting using the weighted mean absolute percentage error. The exact details is roughly around every regularly our quality suite of our software is going to use an evaluation window that uses the actuals in this historical evaluation window as the ground truth and then compare the forecasted values from these various forecasting methods that's generated before the actual become available and using this metric weighted mean absolute percentage error and automatically pick the lowest one as the canonical forecast we're gonna use for this entity. So as you can see from this chart down here, we're drawing this weighted map over time and each color is a candidate's a forecasting method. Some method might be performing the best around zero error for some time, but then it becomes worse than others. And this is very natural. Uh, there's a question, but I'm gonna look at it one second. This is very natural because service uh, life cycle can change and usage pattern can also change. And in order to do that, our system regularly runs this quality detection and update the best performing models. But still, we don't know the future. Something that's best performing today in the past three months might not be the one that's performing better tomorrow and on, but this is still the best we can get. Now, Kevin is asking a question about why not say uh, use 95 percentile of usage forecast. So um, actually, that is going to be talked a little bit in the field slides after this, but we do uh, use the 95 percentile as well in our uh, input signals. In the previous example, when I show the blue line allocation and green line usage, uh, that's just two example series, but it's not uh, comprehensive. We also tried some other percentile based one, and that's why the picking of this model is it's not purely based on three methods. We have actually uh, dozens of candidates that we pick from. But given like an overview, these are the components of things that we use to generate and to uh, evaluate and to pick the best performing one. So that's the overview of how we do capacity planning using, using forecasting. And now I'm gonna share a few customization that is quite unique and we observe in applying forecasting our platform compared to uh, many other forecasting applications. One is this customization of what we see a bunch of big to zero and zero to big cases. So what you're seeing on the right side here is an actual uh, allocation that we observe for one particular service that you can see that going from a large actual allocation back to almost zero in two steps. And this is quite common in capacity land for example, when there is a new data center being deployed and being put in operation, there will be a bunch of services that's either migrating to the new one or appending to the new one. And each of this migration is going to cause a drop in the existing data center and the, in, and the from zero to big increase in the new one. Similarly, if let's say our company is trying to launch a new product feature in emerging market, uh, that will also cause a similar effect of zero to big. So as mentioned earlier, having hundreds of thousands of services that's doing all these organic migrations and changes 
for our team, there is no way for us to track what all is happening and how to accurately capture those. So the best we can do is to use guardrail for forecasting. Well, if there is something really significant, we actually go to reach out to the service owners and understand if something they're planning that's gonna cause a particular pattern, we hard code it with static growth. But the, for the rest majority, we use a percentage cap to cap their forecasting value. So their slope of going high up or declining is not uh, going outrageously drastic. And for the small zero to big cases, we also set a minimum history length so that if there is only data point, two data points, the slope can usually be very high. But if we said that we're gonna use at least six months of your data history before we consider you exist. With this policy, we get a much more reasonable and only capture the significant entities. And that's a lot better than having uh, over forecasting all over the places. But that comes with, there were entities that having actual values incurring, but we're just not capturing them. So for that, we build the extra safety buffer based on error margin for these unknown things that we just cannot capture. So this is a separate one that's very unique to the capacity planning. It's called shared headroom. So for a distributed system like YouTube, um, there were two characteristics that related to capacity planning. One is distributed system resource usually have fungibility, have fungibility over a larger location area. Going back to my toy example of cat searching for the cat video, let's say I search it when everybody else in my neighborhood is also using YouTube. So the original server that's supposed to handle my search request is getting really busy. But the good part is because of network topology, my request can go to a further away server that can still handle my request with a reasonable time, maybe even faster because there is no queue there. So because of this fungibility, as capacity planners, we do not need to build larger capacity for the, survey, for the uh, location near my home. Instead, we can build a more even one expecting them to be able to distribute the load this way. And that usually costs a bit more efficiency savings. The second part is not all software peak their resource consumption at the same time. On the right side, what you're seeing is two services resource usages on the horizon of a couple of days. So for example, the red service usage is peaking at the first orange block, maybe at AM time because it's doing certain database update, while the blue service is peaking at maybe PM time in the second yellow orange block. Uh, yellow block, maybe it's, it's, a, it's a server that actually handle the watch request when more people are watching the videos. The good part is these two services, they share the physical uh, pool of machines that we do not have to build to the peak of A plus the peak of B. Efficiency potential here is we build to the peak of sum instead of summer peak. And this goes back to the earlier question that um, we are not really building the one the, the summation of all the forecast. We're using the shared hydrum and using range-based forecast for a pool of services. Meaning that if you look at this proto concept, uh, chart here, the blue line is, let's say the summation of its usage among these two services or even more. And then we create a baseline forecast, the green line, that probably gonna accommodate the 50 percentile of all the services in this pool's need. But then we do a separate forecast of the P95 forecast, which is probably gonna accommodate the 95 percentile of all the requests in this service, uh, in this group of services then what we actually build is a baseline green plus a safety stock, a percentage-based green that's delta between the red one and the green one, so that we know that while we are not certain we're gonna accommodate all the peak at the same time, we are mathematically certain that we probably get to 95 of it. Does the result function happen in real time? What is the lag based on usage change indicated indicated by the devs. Yeah, okay. so- oh, Randy, uh, I was gonna say, if you would like to wait till the end of your presentation to address questions, feel free to do that as well. 
Okay, I will try to do that. I have a few more slides that I'll share with the group. Thank you, Elaine. Um, so just briefly, we're going to talk about the COVID-19 impact. And we are pretty much done with uh, uh, technical details about how we do forecasting capacity planning. So for the COVID-19, during the first quarter of 2020, we saw a significant increase in watch time around the world. And this comes with demand and supply disruption. We see that demand increase from country lockdown, shelter in place, and school, clo school closure. And we see shift in watch pattern. People used to watch during evening time or during commute. Now they watch anytime. And supply chain disruption, there were actually just people country lockdown, we cannot get the supply. And then people are just physically not able to work for the supply chain companies. For the comp so, so our company actually did a drastic short-term mitigation to handle this COVID-19 impact. One is we build actual soft buffer with short-term estimate. That would basically take away all the forecast with it. And then we just did a short-term evaluation on what we need. And then we leverage distributed system to move them to the surplus resource locations. This goes back to the fungibility example I gave that with a reasonable compromise on promise uh, on the performance, we move things further away when there is more abundant resources. And we did hold off non-essential resource consumption such as feature launches for a while. In terms of forecasting impact, here's an actual example of one of our services, what it went through during the COVID time. Remember, this is a blue line for the actual allocation. And the first chart here is showing that the forecast generated before this COVID time, there is a March 20th horizon where there's like this two uh, step up because of COVID demand increase. The forecast was not usable. So we did the short term mitigation in the previous slide. And the second chart is immediately after the COVID people's pattern change. The forecast is a lot higher. We are not sure if it's not it's, it's usable or not because we don't know how long this is gonna last. And finally, much, much months, many months later now, we see that the forecast has over time corrected itself and become usable again. So this is kind of typical life cycle for our individual services that goes through because of COVID-19's impact. So did we do anything as company level for capacity change because of COVID? We did not. Because even though at global level, COVID-19 effect is pretty obvious, we do not need to tune individual service forecasting because A, capacity is by nature quite volatile and COVID-19 effect, effect is not extra causing the actual deviation. The two charts here are two examples, uh, two services examples uh, allocation over time. And you can see the circle of the COVID-19 impact is not really standing out from its original volatility and deviation. So as mentioned earlier, we already built extra padding for this variance, some, some of various among all the services that even though COVID came, our extra padding was enough, along with the, um, the short-term mitigation I mentioned earlier. So that's all the slides I have. Now I go back to the question. Yeah, the result vulnerability is happening automatically in real time. And basically there will be this load balancing front end and back end that's kind of just routing the request to different places based on the business of this location. So there is really, nothing involved from the developers. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Thank you so much, Ran. That was a really fascinating presentation. Let's see if there are any other questions. What kinds of models have you used? So uh, yeah, so uh, I think in my example, I gave two models. One is the linear momentum, so basic linear regression one. And then also we use uh, uh, models which is having all the seasonality handling. So while I cannot review all the details of names and stuff, we use pretty standard uh, component based like the autoregressive and also the uh, decomposing of the time series, sometimes that's interpolation. So again, I did not have to implement any of these because we can direct call library. So it's a bunch of configuration that I'm gonna turn this feature on versus this one, depending on the nature of service that we have knowledge over. Okay, thank you so much, Ran.